Hello, and welcome to the MS for Mama podcast. I'm your host, Abby Halberstadt, happy wife, mama to 10 Bible-believing Christian. And on today's show, we are just keeping on rolling with our birth stories. It's funny how long you can make a series last when you're talking about 10 children, and that is including two sets of twins, so we get a two-for-one on those birth stories, as well as the fact that I rolled my first three birth stories into one podcast on the intro to this series. If you have not heard it yet, you can go back and listen to that or any of the others so far. Today, we are talking about baby number eight, whose name is Shiloh, and he was kind of a unique birth following Honor's birth. So if you have not heard Honor's birth story yet, you'll want to go back and listen to that because the context of that birth will make this next story makes so much more sense. So if you guys have been following along for a while, you know that we are talking about a lady, me, that's me, who goes long in her gestations of her babies. Her babies like to stay inside and she has come to terms with that. I have come to terms with that. I'll stop talking about myself in the third person and really have gotten to the point where it doesn't bother me. I assume I'm going to go over. Now, there is a certain point, and I reached it absolutely, which you will hear about with Shiloh, where it does feel like, really, Lord, this is a bit much. But I will say that I don't remember which baby I had already had or which which number of babies I had already had when I heard this. But a friend of mine who has four children went to four full weeks past her due date with one of her babies and had a perfectly healthy, normal baby, perfectly healthy, normal delivery. So also, I don't want to completely botch this story, but I'm always in awe of this story whenever I remember it. And whenever I think of going quote unquote long or past your quote unquote due date, I mean, what is a due date even? We know it's just a guess or an estimation because babies come when our bodies are triggered and their bodies are the ones that do it. Their pituitary glands are the ones that trigger our bodies to start saying, okay, we're going to begin this process of bringing this baby out into the air breathing world because they're ready. So it's just this whole complex, really cool thing. But if you've never heard of Nora Lamb, I really encourage you to look up her story. I actually grew up knowing about her story from a movie called China Cry. And she um, was alive during World War II when the Japanese had control of China. She was Chinese. And she has this incredible story of becoming a believer, of facing persecution, of being put in a concentration camp, essentially, when she was quite pregnant. I don't remember how pregnant she was when she went in. But she was there for many months, and the Lord told her that she would have her baby in freedom. And that just seemed impossible because her sentence was much longer than she had left in her pregnancy. And... um I'm not going to tell all of these details correctly. So if you go look up this story and you're like, that's not exactly how it went, I would not even be a little bit surprised. It's been a while since I have even thought about this story, but it popped into my brain now as one that I find somewhat comforting when I think about the fact that the Lord knows the exact hour and minute that our babies are going to be born and that he orchestrates that. So she was in prison and she was promised release, I think maybe early release again. So fact check me or don't. I'm sure my details aren't exactly correct, but... Her prison sentence was going to be commuted. She was going to be let free. And they kept pushing that out, though. It kept getting delayed. And she was still pregnant, and she was still pregnant. And I don't think she knew exactly how many months she was, but she knew she should have been getting close. And this is this tiny woman. She is not tall in stature. There's nowhere for this baby to go but out. And in the movie, you see her having to, like, break up rocks with a pickaxe while she is incredibly pregnant, like, more pregnant than someone should be be allowed to be kind of thing. And yet she still hasn't had this baby. And then finally, the release papers come through and she waddles out the door into, in the movie, she's in the middle of nowhere, dust is blowing, it's a barren desert, it's hot, but she's free. And she does not have that baby until she is in freedom, just like the Lord promised her. And I don't remember the exact amount of time. Again, this is all kind of tenuous in my brain, but it was somewhere between 10 and 11 months of gestation when they added it all up and knowing when she conceived and how long it had been since she'd seen her husband. And so just an incredible story of the Lord's provision and the baby was perfectly healthy. Like it should not have been able to physically be okay. And yet she was, and the baby was as well. So 
Hopefully I told that story correctly enough to not have completely botched it. But my point is the Lord knows the day and the hour. And that has come to be a comfort to me. But at the same time, once you get to a certain point and you're so uncomfortable and so ready to meet this baby, you do start to kind of get a little nervous. Well, Shiloh was ultimately, I'll I'll just give you the spoiler alert here, uh, 17 days overdue if if we're using that term. And so he was my longest overdue. Everybody else has been almost exactly on the 42-week mark if they've gone over considerably. And if you remember, Ezra actually completely threw me for a loop because he was my first and he was six days early, according to my due date. And everybody else has not been that kind. At this point, I don't know that I would consider it kind for a baby to come early because I would be expecting them to come late, kind of like when I talked about an honors birth story that when I started having these very genuine seeming and somewhat alarmingly intense contractions out of nowhere at 36 weeks, I was not ready. I was like, okay, I, I, I just wasn't mentally here yet. And I don't feel physically ready either. So I'm glad that it calmed down. But when I got to the 42 week mark with Shiloh, one of the things that had been happening for about probably a week and a half to two weeks at that point which was different than any other pregnancy was that I've been having bouts of anxiety in the evenings as it began to get dark. And I don't mean anxiety in the sense of I'm scared of labor and oh my goodness, it's going to hurt or will the baby be okay? Or I'm afraid he's going to come out with um, health issues or anything like that. Some of the swirling thoughts about like, whoo, this could be really painful were there because they always are. I know people that say that they've had completely painless labors. Wonderful. I'm not one of those people. I've said this in another one of the podcasts. And so while my labors are not the most painful, they are definitely pretty intense. And honors labor had been especially intense. And I'd had those two hours of back labor in the tub and my body just did its thing and I didn't catch a break and I didn't even honestly feel like I was the one doing the contractions. I was just giving them to the Lord. So there is this concept, I think it's the name of a book called The Body Keeps the Score. And I haven't read the book, so I can't recommend it. But I have heard the premise of it, which is basically you might think you're fine. You might go forward from trauma or a difficult experience or... um or a friendship breakup, or something that left a mark on you, and you don't think about it on a daily basis, and it doesn't seem to be affecting your daily life, until something scratches the surface of where it's gotten buried, until something digs at that old wound, and your body reacts physically, or your mind reacts more strongly than you expect it to. And that's where I found myself in the evenings for about the last, like I said, about the last two weeks of my pregnancy with Shiloh, And it was so frustrating because I'd be fine during the day. I wouldn't be tapping my toes and being like, when is this baby going to show up? Come on, get out of here. Just living my life as well as I could as a very, very pregnant woman, pretty uncomfortable, ready to meet her baby, but okay with things. But my thoughts would start to get agitated in the evening. And it felt like a vice was on my chest and my chest would start to constrict and tighten. And I would start to feel slightly panicky and I would have trouble focusing on anything for very long. And anytime I even sort of tiptoed up to the concept of having a baby, it felt like something I could not possibly ever do again, which was so strange because this is baby number eight. I've already done this seven times. So not having had a lot of experience with birth anxiety up to this point, I mean, I had dreaded the pain before, but true actual anxiety where you don't have a whole lot of control of what's going on. I found myself crying out to the Lord each evening as I sat there in a chair with my brain buzzing and my chest tight and feeling like I couldn't focus and I couldn't be at peace. Lord, help me to get through this. And the help that he gave me primarily came from scripture, which it so often does. We know that scripture is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. We know that in Psalm 23, he's going to lead us beside still waters. And we know that Jesus is the bread of life and that we drink from the well of his goodness and truth that we are never thirsty again. So we have to keep returning to that, but it quenches our thirst spiritually. And so I felt like my brain was not functioning like I wanted it to. I felt like my body was reacting like I didn't want it to for sure. 
And this baby was not coming. And I knew from past experience that the tenser and more stressed out and more anxious I am, the more my body shuts down the whole birthing process. So I started thinking, well, if I'm this stressed two weeks out, how stressed will I be when I actually have to deliver? Well, guess what, guys? If you think about things like that, it doesn't make you less stressed. If you worry about what your stress is going to do to your body, then it just creates more stress and the stress does its job, which is to shut down the way your body and your mind function correctly. So being aware of it wasn't enough. The biggest thing that I did was I wrote scripture on three by five note cards. And when my brain would start to buzz and my chest would start to tighten, I would go through these time worn promises from God that he would never leave me or forsake me, that when I was afraid that I could trust in him, that he had good plans for me, that every good and perfect gift comes from the father of lights in whom there's no changing or shifting shadow, that he was a God of love, not of, you know, trying to squash me with anxiety or anything like that, that he wanted me to dwell on whatever was good and lovely and right and pure and admirable and praiseworthy and excellent And so I was just actively returning my mind again and again to these concepts. And I will tell you this, it was not an immediate relief and it was not a perfect fix, but it helped me to devote my attention to truth rather than to just kind of a worry stone of stress over what might happen. Or like I said, even, even if I didn't feel like I was scared of what might happen, the stress was still there kind of crouching in the back of my mind. And it took me a while and it took me a long time to articulate the fact that honors birth being fast and hard and different and unexpected had left this mark on me that was making me react this way because I wanted to say, and and someone else who's had a much more traumatic birth might be rolling their eyes at my saying that they go back and listen to honors birth story and they're like, Lady, you had a perfectly healthy birth. You didn't push for that long. You were fine. So what? You were in, you know, intense pain for two hours and, you know, you couldn't talk, whatever. That's my story every single time. And I do feel like it's easy to be dismissive of someone else's concerns. I I can be the same way when we're not the one that's experiencing them. But I will say that even if your birth trauma is not the same as someone else's, even if your birth trauma results in a perfectly healthy baby, if it's something that your body wasn't expecting and your brain wasn't expecting, it can still leave a mark. So I started realizing that honors birth had made me fearful of future births, even if I hadn't been actively expecting that or thinking that I would feel this way when it got to the point. So the closer I got to birth, the more anxious I got. Well, we did all kinds of other things to distract me too. Those those scripture memory cards kept my mind on truth and they kept me from, you know, running, screaming out of the house or waddling, screaming out of the house, but didn't completely dispel kind of the jitteriness that I felt. And my body was doing what it has done many times before that I've told you guys about, where it goes into prodromal labor and It for sure feels like it could go somewhere, but again, I'm ignoring it until it actually does something that establishes a really strong pattern and feels really intense. But this time it was ramping up until it felt pretty intense and I was trying to ignore it because I felt a little panicky about this being the real deal, but it was kind of hard to ignore and then all of a sudden it would stop. So my brain was feeling even more jerked around than usual and Anytime my body would establish a pattern, because my mom was trying to be so helpful and sweet, she was taking the kids to her house, which is so kind. I mean, I know many of you are thinking, I wish I had a mom who would take a bunch of kids home with her whenever I thought I was in labor. But the funny thing is it started backfiring because as gracious and kind as that is, when your brain is running 100 miles an hour and stressed out, One of the best things for you is mundane things, making a peanut butter sandwich, doing some laundry, reading to a kid, wiping a bottom. It takes your mind off of the thing that your mind is trying to dwell on in an intense or obsessive way. And so each time, especially during the evenings when my mom had taken the kids home with her and I've lost track of how many times it happened, probably not as many as I think, but maybe four. 
I would realize the house was too clean, which is not normal at all. <laughs> but I was just trying to make sure that it was ready for the baby, trying to make sure it was ready for the baby. So constantly cleaning up, constantly sweeping. I'd realize the house was too clean. I didn't have anything to do with myself for the evenings. It was too quiet. There wasn't anybody tugging on me or asking for something. And it just gave way too much space for my brain to do its stressed out, anxious thing. So Sean kept coming up with new ways to distract me. Absolutely, we went to Lowe's, as we always do, it seems like. We went out to dinner a couple of times. One time we went and saw a very silly movie that I can't remember very well and didn't enjoy and was in a pretty decent amount of pain throughout, like contracting very regularly. Still not in labor, though. The best distraction, though, and this one actually was legit, was that we have this little mini excavator and Sean has done a lot of clearing. We've built two houses. He's done a ton of clearing. And this little mini excavator is what he uses to pull up small trees when he does clearing to dig out things that he needs digging out that are that are not a big project, like not like a pond, but something a little more small scale than that. And there's a very steep hill behind our house. And I remember one day I was just kind of pacing and I had done the dishes and I had folded the laundry and nobody was home and I was twiddling my thumbs and feeling stressed. And he said, how about we go up on the hill and you pull some saplings out that I need cleared with my mini excavator. And I remember looking at him like, how's that going to help anything? He's like, hey, might help you get some aggression out. Like you never know, this could be really helpful. So I huffed and puffed up that hill because it really is quite steep. And I was 42 weeks pregnant, I think at this point, fully 42 weeks pregnant. And I got on that mini excavator and he sat right beside me and helped me learn the controls. And it was just the most cathartic, just best get your angst out session that I've maybe ever had. It was awesome. It was such a good idea. But the thing that I found was that my body was so keyed into this concept of going into labor, but not really going into labor that just about anything I did only calmed the stress down for short periods of time. And so one night I woke up contracting and started timing because they seemed pretty regular. They seemed like they were getting more intense. Again, this has happened over and over again, but these felt a little different. And as I was lying there, Sean was asleep. Babies were at the, the kids were at my parents' house. And as I was lying there timing these contractions, this bubble of panic just broke. And I had a very small scale beginning and could have gone a lot worse, but the only panic attack that I believe that I've had of my entire life, where I found myself struggling to sit up in bed, struggling to breathe, struggling to calm my thoughts. And it was so strange because there was no particular impetus for it. It wasn't like something had changed. It wasn't like it was, my body was doing anything different than all the other painful, frustrating stop, start labor symptoms that it normally does. But for some reason, waking up to it and maybe not having time to clear my thoughts or, or say much scripture to myself or pray, just kind of going right into it from sleep, I couldn't get anything regulated. So I remember kind of swiping at Sean whacking him with my hand saying, please get up. I can't breathe. And of course he thinks that I'm, that I'm actually having a medical emergency, which I guess I sort of am. But more than anything, I knew I just had to get my heart rate down and I had to get my breathing under control. And so he sat up with me and helped me breathe, just the ma's breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth, in through the nose, out through the mouth, prayed with me, I got my scripture cards and read through those and I got everything calmed down pretty quickly. So I wouldn't say full blown panic attack, but it was such a scary experience to feel it going that direction. Kind of like you're in a car that starts going too fast and you hit the brakes and the brakes just don't work. Thankfully, we got the brakes going again. So definitely had a very jumpy uterus at this point. It felt like just about anything kicked it into rapid contractions, painful contractions, and I'm exhausted and I am mentally very, very loopy at this point. I don't feel ready to have this baby mentally, but I feel so ready to have this baby mentally, which is a really frustrating place to be. If you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. So Shiloh was born on February 6th, 2019. And the panic attack and all of this situation happened on February 4th. 
4th, or maybe it was the middle of the night, or the early morning of February 5th, I think. And the, I remember the next day, I kept trying to lie down and go to sleep, and I wouldn't have any contractions. Like, they'd just gone completely. And then I would lie down, and I would start that lovely, delicious feeling of falling into sleep, and I would have this horrible, really intense contraction. It was like, it was like a spiritual attack. And I would gasp and wake up in the middle of this horrible contraction and then contract for about 15 minutes, then try to fall back asleep after they stopped. And as soon as I started sliding into sleep, they would start back up again. Um, it was similar in some ways to how I felt at the very end of my pregnancy with Evie and Nola, where I was having adrenal failure and was having shakes and stop start labor and felt physically incapable of doing this one minute and perfectly fine the next. Very strange sensation. And again, very frustrating. So I am talking to my midwife. I'm 42 weeks and two days, three days, somewhere around there at this point. She says we need to come in and do a biophysical um, sonogram to make sure that you're amniotic fluid levels are okay and the placenta hasn't degraded and you're just, you know, you're just doing fine. And so I feel defeated. That's probably the best word to use for it. I feel defeated. I feel like I can't win this particular battle, which is a ridiculous thing to say because winning the battle is getting the baby out. The baby has to come out. Therefore, the battle will be won at some point. But I, yeah, it's just, it's just a really... It's just a really um, low point. It was a huge low point for me. So we go in, I get dressed, I put on makeup for the first time. I, you know, put some earrings on in a vain attempt to raise my spirits, put some cute shoes on. I'm just trying whatever I can to feel normal because I feel far from normal. And we go in and we do the biophysical sonogram and everything looks fine. And the guy that does these sonograms is very friendly. He makes jokes. He's funny, genuinely. He's not grating or obnoxious. And normally, Sean and I banter with him and with my midwife, and we have a good time. I remember I basically found a focal point in the corner of the room and stared like someone who had gone catatonic, because that's about how I felt. I had no emotional energy left, and I just didn't feel like I could do this anymore. Again, head knowledge, I had to do it. Emotional knowledge, it didn't feel possible. And my midwife is holding my hand and looking at me and looking a little worried because she's never seen this version of Abby before. Honestly, I don't know that I'd ever seen this version of Abby before. I am naturally, this is no great credit to me. This is just who I am naturally that the Lord has made me kind of a grit your teeth and okay, this is not working. So we're just going to do the next thing. And I just didn't feel like I had any next things left. And I was planning on having a home birth, but every time I went home, I felt stressed out and anxious because it was too quiet, like I'd talked about before. So my midwife, after the sonogram, said, what do you need? What do you need? How can I help you? And I said, I don't know, Lena. I kind of I kind of don't have the mental capacity to come up with like a game plan. I'm kind of sucked dry at this point. I feel very pulled around. And she's like, I know this is really different for you. I'm sorry. This is hard. So she validated everything I was feeling, but she said, maybe you could go out to dinner with friends. And I said, I will if you think I should. Well, actually, what she said was, you can go home. And I was like, I can't go home. <laughs> I'm not going home. I'm not doing that. She's like, maybe you could go have dinner with friends, try to do something that takes your mind off of it. I was like, Melina, we've honestly been doing that for several nights. And I I don't have the mental capacity to make like small talk or, or any other kind of talk. This is about what I've got. And she... Um, she said, I'm going to give you this homeopathic. I'm pretty sure it was called Rescue Remedy, if I remember correctly. And it's just supposed to help relax you. It's supposed to help with stress and anxiety. So I put this little pill underneath my tongue. And she's talking me through my options. And I'm not trying to be stubborn, but I don't feel like I have any options. That's the mental place that I'm in. So I'm sure I was being kind of stubborn. And she says, you know, maybe you could do this. Maybe you could do that. And I'm like, I'll, I'll, if you tell me to go do something, I'll do it. But outside of like midwife's orders, I, I don't know. I just don't, don't have much. And she's got her hand on my stomach and she says, there's a contraction. And I'm like, yeah. But the thing was, I had basically stopped contracting once I'd stopped trying to take those naps that kept freaking out my uterus and throwing me into major contractions. 
So I hadn't contracted all afternoon, but once or twice. So the fact that I was having contractions again, I was trying to ignore because I didn't want to get my hopes up, but it was still a little bit hopeful because I'd had like two others while he was doing the sonogram. And let me tell you the amount of times that I've had this 42 week sonogram and either been in labor or gone in labor right afterwards, my body's like, okay, okay, I get it. We have to get the baby out. So maybe I should have those earlier. So I'm having these contractions every five minutes or so based on my mental calculations. They feel close-ish, but not super close. And she's like, there's another one. And I'm like, yeah, I know they do this all the time. I don't think it's going to do any good. And she said, well, if you don't want to go home, why don't you just have the baby here at the birth center? And you guys, sometimes it is the simplest things that are the mindset shift that we need. I needed a mindset shift. I needed something to be different. I needed something to boot me out of this feeling of despair and this rut that I was in that I've been in for a version, you know, in some version of for two weeks. And when she said that, I hadn't even considered a birth center birth because I I love home births and that was where it was going to be. But the moment she said it, this just shaft of bright light of hope just broke through my mind. And I said, wait, can can I do that? She's like, sure, why not? I mean, we're here. You're here. There goes another contraction. You know, I mean, let's let's have a baby here. And that, that was what I needed. That was, I have no idea why that is the thing that did the trick. But I proceeded to labor oh, for a while. I don't think I had Shiloh for another 13 hours. And it was a really calm labor for the most part, which is so interesting because my body had been anything but calm and my brain had been anything but calm. But pretty much from the moment that I decided to stay at the birth center, I realized, Lord, this was your plan all along. This is where I'm supposed to be. This is where I feel peace. Sean was good with it. Melina was already there. The midwife's assistant was available as well. And so I um, rocked on the birthing ball and they did spinning baby positions with me. And they did the little thing that starts with an R with the scarf where they put a scarf under your belly and shake it back and forth. Reiki or something. I'm making that up probably, but I can't remember the exact term for it to help position the baby. Well, they brought me snacks. It was just kind of like being in this little spa retreat while having a baby which was an interesting experience. It wasn't something I was expecting. And I felt like things were progressing. I started to kick into a good pattern. It started to get more intense, which felt hopeful. And it stayed intense and it got more intense, which felt even more hopeful because even though it's painful, it wasn't out of control feeling like it was with honor. And I did something that a lot of people will think is very strange. And it's something that I'd done with Theo I believe that I've told you this before. And that is I lay there on the bed on my back with my heels together, my knees butterflied out, and I just breathed Shiloh down. I just inhale, exhale. I don't, I didn't need any Lama's breathing. I didn't need anyone counting for me or helping. It just felt like I had everything that I needed in myself in that moment to relax and be in the moment and be very present with those contractions and not fight them and not fear them, which is the exact opposite of how I'd felt for the last two weeks. So that in and of itself was a miracle. It literally felt like a miracle, how your brain can go from being so fearful and resistant of something and triggering your body into literally waking you up from sleep to have contractions and then stopping when you're awake. Like how backwards is that? to steadily doing its thing once you have calmed down, once you found something that gives you peace. It's just amazing. So I did that for probably two hours as they got more and more intense and I knew that it was working. So when she checked me, I think I was somewhere around between an eight or a nine. And that felt like such a good place to be, having a baby soon, right? This can't be that much longer. So I asked for them to get the tub ready because I'd been able to have the tub birth, the water birth with honor. But yet again, it didn't completely kill my contractions, but it did slow everything down again. So I labored in the tub for quite a while. I I, have lost track of how long it was, but it was probably at least two hours. And I would even have contractions to the point of feeling like I was bearing down and like I could push and just nothing would happen. I couldn't get in a good position. And so my midwife said, okay, I need you to go out, get out. And so after a while, I mean, we were all falling asleep. Oh, funny story. So Sean was on a stool behind me, like putting 
a washcloth on my neck and rubbing my shoulders and just supporting me. And it was, we had been doing this for a long time and he was so tired. He was hanging in there. And at one point we heard this giant thump and we all startle and wake up because the midwives were kind of starting to doze too. I was half asleep between contractions and we look back and Sean has fallen asleep and like hit his head on the wall behind him. He was fine. But we all woke up. We got a little jolt of adrenaline. And at that point, my midwife said, okay, I mean, there's not a problem. You're still contracting regularly, but I need you to get out, use the restroom, try to shake things up and get things moving. So I did the dreaded waddle to the bathroom, straddle the toilet, let the contractions come, came back and tried the water a little more, still wasn't progressing. She got me out and said, you just really kind of need to be out and move around. And everything started progressing really quickly after that. And I've lost track of the amount of time, but this is, he was born around four in the morning and this is probably two in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. And so I start swaying and rocking and walking and the contractions are ramping up and ramping up and ramping up. And I'm thinking, here we go. So she um, wanted me to get on hands and knees over a ball and use that as support and see if that would help him descend some more. And I've never delivered a baby other than honor in the water in any position other than on my back. And again, all my natural birthers are like, why would you do this to yourself, Abby? And I've explained it in other episodes, but it's just, it just works for me. That's really all I can say. I've tried standing up. I've tried a couple of other positions and for whatever reason, they just felt really uncomfortable. And I think the ultimate thing for delivering a baby is that you have a baby in the position that feels comfortable for you and gets the baby out well. And I've never really had long pushing sessions other than Theo's, which still was only about an hour. So hands and knees, definitely feeling a little bit mentally trepidatious about this. Like, Ooh, I've never done this before. I don't know if I like this. This doesn't feel like I'm as in as much control as usual. And so my body starts pushing And he came out bit by bit. I remember each time she told me which part of him was out thinking there is no way that that's the only amount of baby that has come out of me so far with all this pushing. She told me it was the most gradual, gentle birth that she's seen me do, but it felt like work. It felt like work. Probably the three that it felt like the most work in terms of actually getting the baby out of my body were Simon, who was 23 three and a half, 24 inches long, nine pounds, two ounces, big old man child when he was born. Um, Theo, who had the core wrapped around his body, not his, not his neck, but his body. And it kept pulling him back. So I had to fight with that. And Shiloh, who ended up being eight pounds, 15 ounces, I believe, um, like 22 inches long. He wasn't small, but he wasn't huge. And for whatever reason, he was just really gradual. So pushed him out on hands and knees bit by bit and caught him and got to pull him up to my chest while I was still on my hands and knees. And there's this really fun picture. I'll link his birth story so you can see this picture. Remember how I got all dressed up and put on the earrings to go to my biophysical sonogram just as some way to do a pick-me-up? Well, I never took the earrings off. So I have my hair done and I have earrings on (laughs) in this picture. Like I got all dolled up for labor when I didn't. I was just trying to lift my spirits. And there's this picture where I'm holding him and Sean's beside me and we're just both grinning our faces off with this brand new baby boy that we just caught. And my earrings are dangling. And it's just this moment of pure joy that honestly felt impossible. As much as I knew that it had to be possible because babies don't stay in forever, it felt impossible so many times, which is why I so often say that our feelings are not truth and that they can't be the determiner of our actions because they will lie to us. And sometimes our feelings will be true in the sense that what they're telling us, you're scared, you're stressed, you're having a reaction to a labor that freaked you out before. Those are all true things. We still have to keep searching for that thing that helps us to overcome. Thankfully, the Lord's so gracious to provide it. And he provided it in a way that I was not expecting at all. So that's my only birth center birth that I've ever done. And while I think if I had any births in the future, I would still choose to plan to have them at home. I would definitely be more open-handed about different possibilities, just knowing that sometimes just a change of venue can help your brain and your body to do its thing. I also think 
the fact that I ended up having Shiloh in a birth center helped set me up for being more flexible with where I would ultimately end up having my most recent birth, which was the twin beast, Titus and Toby, which will be the birth that we talk about on our next podcast. So stay tuned for that. I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode and I look forward to chatting with you more in the future. If you guys enjoyed today's program, I would be so honored if you would subscribe and share with others. And if you're looking for more daily content on motherhood and biblical responses to cultural issues, you can follow along on Instagram at m.is.4.mama.